Okay, so I think we're at the um, half hour, so I think we can start. So uh, I'm Yuval, I'm chairing the session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Francois Legal from uh, Nagoya University, and he'll be talking about average case quantum advantage for shallow circuits. Please go ahead, Francois. Okay, thank you. So this work is basically basically based on that uh, that the paper with a few new insights and discussion of uh, recent uh, related works. Okay, so of course we all know we we all have uh, strong evidence that quantum computation is more powerful than classical computation. For example, short algorithms. Okay, we can factorize integer very fast on the quantum computer and classically we don't know such uh, an efficient uh, algorithm. But this is not a proof because we cannot currently prove that there is no efficient algorithm, classical algorithm for integer factoring. And the main goal of quantum computational complexity is really to give a mathematical proof of the superiority of quantum computation with respect to classical computation. And many such proofs, formal proofs, are known for models like query complexity or communication complexity. A very simple example is a Grover search. If you assume that you can access your input only through an oracle, it's easy to show that you need n queries to solve the search problem. While using Grover search, you can do it with square root n queries. So square root n versus n, this gives you a separation between classical and quantum computation. And you can have similar computation in other models like communication complexity. But in um, the, the real goal of quantum computational complexity is to obtain separation for the basic models, Turing machines or circuits. And we have some ways of obtaining uh, evidence of the superiority of quantum computation in such settings. A first way is to consider relativized separations. Okay, to consider separation with respect to an oracle. We assume that you have access to some black box, magical black box that gives you some power. And you need to compare the power of classical computation when, access, when the computation can access that black box and quantum computation when the quantum computation can access this black box. And then it's easy to show separations, for example, dating back from um, 93, it was shown that BQPO, so with respect to the Oracle O, is not included in BPPO. Okay, so BQP is a class of Boolean function that can be computed with high probability by efficient quantum circuits. And BPP is a corresponding class for classical computation. And there have been a lot of such a relativized separation, and the most recent one is a famous BQPO, not in PHO. So PH is a polynomial hierarchy, it's a very large class. So BQP is not even in PH with respect to some oracle. So these kind of separations are for Boolean functions. So functions that output zero or one. If you are okay with separation for sampling problems, then you can actually prove unrelativized separation, separation without any oracle. And I will talk about this in this talk. Okay. So what is a sampling problem? So consider, for example, family of uh, quantum circuits, so polynomial time quantum circuit with classical input and classical output. So this means that we have here bits as input, of course, encoded as a quantum state. Then you perform some measurement at the end and you get some classical output, so n bits, for example. And of course, the output is random. So what you really get is a probability distribution over binary strings of length n. And uh, Terrell and uh, Di Vincenzo in 2002 showed that quantum circuits can sample from probability distributions that cannot be efficiently sampled exactly by a classical computer under some assumption. The assumption is that the polynomial hierarchy does not collapse. And almost everybody believes that. It's some 
conjecture are very close to the p not equal np problem. So everybody believes that. Okay, so under this uh, assumption, very likely assumption, then quantum circuit can sample from probability distribution that cannot be efficiently sampled exactly by a quantum computer. Okay, but exact sampling is a very strong um, requirement. And it has been shown later that assuming further conjecture on the oddness of the perma permanent, quantum circuit can sample from probability distribution that cannot be efficiently sampled by a classical classical computer even approximately with additive precision. Okay, so not only exactly sampling from the distribution, but also approximating the distribution is hard for a classical computer. Okay, and here you see you have uh, several components in the statement. You have some kind of likely but unproven conjecture here and some kind of uh, standard complexity theoretic assumptions. Okay, and there have been a huge amount of further works uh, dealing in the replacing the conjecture by other typically weaker conjectures using weaker complexity theoretical assumptions and also proving the superiority of quantum computation even for weaker models. Okay. For example, random quantum circuits, constant depth quantum circuit, or noisy quantum circuit. The main motivation is, is that, that we want to prove the superiority of quantum circuits that can be implemented with current technology or can be implemented in the very near future. And the main conclusion is that under plausible conjectures and complex theoretical assumptions, even weak classes of quantum circuits, so for example, constant depth circuit, can sample from probability distribution that are very hard to sample by efficient classical circuits, okay, even approximating. It's a very good evidence of the superiority of quantum computation with respect to classical computation under some conjecture and assumptions. And the question today is whether we can prove similar superiority results without relying on any conjecture or assumptions. Okay. Such kind of unconditional separation between uh, computational model, in that case quantum and classical, can be seen as a holy grail for quantum computational complexity. Okay. And a breakthrough um, occurs in uh, 2017. So Bravi, Gosset, and Koenig were able to show the following theorem. So there exists a computational problem, some computational problem that can be solved by a quantum circuit of constant depths. Okay. So the computational problem, I will explain it later, but it receives some input and should output something, some bit of string, uh, some uh, string of bits, sorry. And there is a constant depth quantum circuit that solves the problem on all inputs. But any classical circuit that solves the problem on all inputs requires log depth. Okay, so classically log depth is necessary, quantumly constant depth is enough. So this gives you a huge gap between the depth complexity of classical circuit and quantum circuit. And the very nice thing is there is no conjecture or assumptions in this result. It's really an unconditional separation between classical, the powers of classical machines and quantum machines. Okay. The weakness, of course, is that it's only a separation between constant depths, quantum constant depths, and classical logarithmic depths. Okay, so classical logarithmic depths is not a very hard class, it's not a very large complexity classes. It's kind of computation that can be still done fairly efficiently on a classical computer. But it is still a first significant step in giving un unconditional separation between classical and quantum. Okay, so now a few remarks um, before presenting uh, our main result. So first, in this talk, all the circuits have bounded fanin, so I can explain what this means. Um, 
what does it mean? This means if you consider a gate of your circuit, the number of input wires of your gate is constant. Okay, it's bounded, bounded by a constant. It may be one, two, three, but it's a bounded by a constant. Okay? And we don't have any uh, constraint on the number of output wires. Of course, if it, is a if it is a classical gate, the number of output wires should be the same as the number of input wires. But if it is a classical gate, we don't have, we don't even require this, uh, this assumption. It can be arbitrarily large for classical gates. But the fanning, the number of input wires for each gate should be bounded by a constant, for example, two. Okay, so we will use a lot this assumption in this talk, I mean. Okay, the second thing is that the computational problem I defined here can be defined in several ways. You can consider it as a sampling problem or consider it as a relation. Okay, so if you know what a relation is, it's generalization of a Boolean function. Since I believe that most of you are more familiar with sampling problem, to, today I will talk about, I will interpret this result as a separation for a sampling problem. It will be more natural for most of you, I think. Okay, so now let's look again at the statement here. It says that any classical circuit that solves the problem on all inputs require logarithmic depth. So it's some kind of worst case our classical hardness result. And what we have been able to prove is that you can give an average case classical hardness version of the theorem. Okay, so there exists a computational problem, another computational problem, such that as before, it can be solved by a constant depth quantum circuit on all inputs, but any classically circuit that solves the problem with high probability of the non-negligible fraction of inputs require logarithmic depth. Okay, this is a much weaker assumption here. We don't require the circuit to solve the problem on all inputs, only on a very, very small fraction. And we say that if this happens, then the circuit should have logarithmic depth. So you can think of this version as a stronger evidence of the superiority of quantum computation with respect to classical computation. And actually, similar results and variants of this result have been obtained independently by several of, of uh, other researchers in the past two or three years. Okay, so I will give a comparison of this version and the other version at the very end of the talk. Okay, so let me try to explain uh, the result uh, in uh, more detail. The basic uh, concept uh, that we will use is the concept of graph state. So most of you, I think, are familiar with graph state, but I will still give um, a definition here. So for any graph, you can associate a quantum state called the graph state. And this is the quantum state obtained by the following process. You prepare one quantum bit for each node in the state plus the state, and you apply a control Z operation on the qubits corresponding to each edge of the graph. So let's see an example. For this graph, you have six nodes. So you prepare six qubit initialized to the plus state. And for each edge of the graph, you apply a control Z. So for example, for this age, you will have this control Z. For this one, you will have this control Z. And so control Z is this uh, gate represented here in the picture here. Okay, so observe that for this uh, uh, implementation, for this circuit, the depth is four. So I define the depth as a number of layers. Okay, so it's a layer number one, layer number two, layer number three, layer number four. Okay, so it's a quantum circuit of depth, of depth four. It's not very difficult to see that 
if the graph has constant degree, okay, the degree is the number of edges uh, connected to each node. So if each node is connected to only a constant number of edges, then the corresponding graph state can be constructed by a quantum circuit of constant depth. Okay, it's fairly easy to, to, to show this, and we will use this fact a lot today. Okay, so graph states associated to, to graphs of a constant degree are easy to create, but we will see that they still exhibit some global entanglements that cannot be simulated in constant depths by classical circuit. Okay, this is the main message of this talk. Okay, so all the results I will explain today are based on a beautiful construction by Barrett et al. In to, dating back from 2007. Okay, so I will first explain that construction. So you consider a ring, a ring of n nodes. Consider that graph. N is a multiple of three. And I see it as a triangle. So here, for example, I will take N equal 18, and I see it as a triangle where with three sides of length N over three nodes. Okay, so now I assume that each of the three corners receive as input a bit, B1, B2, B3. And I will now define the computational problem so that each node will, at the end, output one bit. So this node will need to output one bit, this one node one bit, and so on. And I denote these bits by Z1, Z2, up to Z8. Okay. Okay. So I will define a specific uh, computational problem in a few minutes. But before that, I define four four bits, four quantities, so MR, MB, ML, M odd. There are four bits. MR is a bit obtained by taking the parity of all the nodes of even index on the right. Okay, Z2, Z4, Z6, so even index on the right side. ZB is the same but on the bottom, so Z8, Z10, Z it takes the parity of the three bits. And ZML is the same for the left, so Z14, 16, and 18. And M odd are all the other, the parity of all the other bits. So I define them. Okay. And now I define one protocol. The first step of the protocol, all the nodes will prepare the graph state corresponding to the whole triangle. Okay, so we prepare the graph state corresponding to the whole uh, protocol. This can be done very easily. If you are interested in the complexity of doing this, you really need to, co to, to communicate with your neighbor. So this can be done by, by, with very, very local um, uh, communication, only speaking with your next neighbor. And then all the nodes will do a measurement. The non-corner nodes will measure their qubit in the X basis, always the X basis. Okay, they do the measurement in the X basis. This gives you one bit. So making a measurement in the X basis is essentially applying the Adama gate and then measuring in the computational basis. This gives you one bit, zero or one, and you will output that bit. For corner nodes, so there are three corner nodes, this one, this one, and this one, the rule is slightly different. If the bit received is X, sorry, if the bit received is zero, you perform a measurement in the X basis, otherwise you perform a measurement in the Y basis. Okay, and you output what you obtain. Okay, so this is a quantum protocol, quantum process, 
And now I claim that this quantum protocol samples from the uniform superposition over all binary strings here, Z1, Z2, Zn. Well, actually, it should be a small n instead of a large n here, but um, uh, Zn satisfying two conditions. This condition and one of the four conditions here, depending on the value of B1, B2, B3. Okay, so let's try to analyze this. I will start with this, okay? The parity of MR, MB, ML is zero. So what is it? Let's uh, try to do right things here. I'm saying MR, this, M4, this is MR, then you have MB, which is that, that, and then ML, which is this, this, and this. And I'm measuring every, everything in the X basis, okay? So it's easy to see that the, measuring, the measurement operator is actually one element of the stabilizer of the graph state, which means that the measurement outcome, the parity of the, all the measurement of com, outcome of these uh, qubits, of these bits, uh, sorry, the measurement of convex qubits, so all these bits, the parity of all these bits, will be zero with probability one, okay? Because the measurement operator is in the stabilizer of the graph state. Okay. So now let's try to understand this, this case. So if everything is, Zero. So in that case, we measure this in X basis, X basis, X basis. And we look at M odd. What is M odd? M odd is the parity of all these bits. Since every, everything is measured in the X basis, from exactly the same argument as here, we conclude that it is zero with probability one, okay? So we have this condition. So now, next step. What happened here? In that case, here it's Y measurement. Y measurement and X measurement. And we focus on this. That means that we focus on all these bits. Okay, as before, but we also add this, this, and this. And it's easy to see that the corresponding measurement operator is in it's not in the stabilizer, but the negation of it is in stabilizer. So that's why you get a one here with probability. And so on for this and this. Okay, so it's very easy from the standard rules of measurements of stabilizer state to analyze what's happened when you measure the state in those bases and to conclude that uh, you obtain uniform distributions over all strings satisfying those conditions. Okay. So next step. Let's see what happened in the classical setting. I'm, claimed that I'm claiming that any classical protocol that samples from the same distribution requires communication between two nodes very far apart. It's fairly easy to show. Consider a classical protocol with no communication between nodes located at distance n over six, larger than n over six. Then what can you say? What you can say is that MR, so what is MR? MR is a sum of the parity of this bit, this bit, and this bit. Okay, so nodes on the right side. Since there is no communication between nodes at distance larger than n over six, information about B3 
cannot reach the right side. Okay? So MR cannot depend on B3. Okay, so first. Second thing, since B1 and B2 are at distance n over 3, it's impossible to gather the information about B1 and B2 if you send information at distance smaller than n over 6. Okay, so MR cannot depend on the product B1 times B2. So the conclusion is that MR should be an affine function of B1 and B2. And similarly, MB should be an affine function of B2 and B3. And ML an affine function of B1 and B3. And ML an affine function B1, B2, and B3. Okay, so you can write all these functions, they are affine function using some coefficients, and see if you can find some functions that satisfy all these linear equations. And the conclusion is that it's impossible. It's impossible to have a set of parameters so that the function are affine functions satisfying this condition and satisfy all these linear equations. Okay? So the conclusion is that any protocol that samples from the same distribution requires communication between nodes which are far apart. And the proof is really that, very simple. Okay, so what we have shown is that this problem, which is generating the graph state and measuring it in the basis specified by the input and outputting uh, the measurement outcomes, can be solved in the quantum setting very easily. You only need some communication with your neighbors, but classically you need long distance communication. So this gives you a quantum advantage for some kind of distributed computing over a ring. Over a ring, you can do everything, solve the problem with local communication only in the quantum setting, only communicating with your neighbors, but classically it's much more difficult. You need very long communication, okay? So this was essentially what um, was proved in the paper by Barrett et al, 2007, and recently we give a formal interpretation of that separation in the framework of distributed computing. And now I will explain how to convert that separation for uh, distributed computing into a separation for circuits. Okay? And I will define the computational problem used to obtain that separation. So you consider a square grid of n nodes, okay, a two grid. So square root n times square root n, so n nodes. And we use m to denote the number of edges. So m will is the order of n, okay, because it's a grid. So the number of edges is almost the same as the number of um, vertices. And the output of the computational problem we'll consider is a pair AB, where A is a binary string of length m, and B is a binary string of length n. Okay? And the computational problem simply asks to sample from the distribution obtained when measuring in the basis specified by the string B, the graph state corresponding to the graph specified by the string A. So let's see one example. N equal nine, so nine nodes. So in that case, you have 12 edges. So A is a binary string of length 12, and B a binary string of length 9, okay? And A specifies a subgraph that we are considering. We have a 1 if we are keeping the age, and a 0 if you don't keep the age. So here this means that we keep the age only 1, 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 10, 11. So if you assume the usual order, this means that we are considering this graph state. And B specifies a measurement basis, the measurement basis. So we measure nodes number one, two, five, and seven in the say Y basis and the other in the X basis. Okay? So A specifies a subgraph and B specifies a basis. 
and when the, the goal is to output to sample from the distribution obtained when we measure the corresponding uh, graph state in the specified basis. And of course, this can be solved on all inputs by a constant depth quantum circuit because the, graphs, the corresponding graph states can be computed by circuits of constant depth because the graphs have constant degree. It's a very trivial to prove that. So now we'd like to prove the second part, the classical lower bound. And this is a tricky part. We need to prove that any classical circuit that solves this problem requires logarithmic depth. Okay? So let's give uh, the main idea of the proof. So consider a small classical circuit. Was, sorry, more precisely, a classical circuit of small depths, say smaller than log n divided by 100. That solves the problem. Okay, so the circuit has input wires, so n plus n input wires and n output wires. Okay, so I will use a small picture here. It would be probably easier to understand. So you have our circuit here, and you have M wires to specify A, input wire, N wire to specify B, and N wire for the output, Z. Okay? And each of the wire here specify the basis for one of the nodes of the grid that correspond to one of the nodes of the grid. And if of the output wire correspond to the output of measuring the corresponding node of the grid. Okay, so each output wire correspond to one node of the grid. And now what we will do, we will write the input output correspondence of the circuit by arrow on the grid. So I will take here one specific example. So assume, for example, that this wire, input wire, the ninth, uh, the, the, the ninth uh, input wire here, so B9 influences the input wire 28 here. Z28. So in that case, what I will do, I will put an arrow between this node, the node number nine here, and this one, the node number 28, showing that the input wire B9 influences the output wire Z28. And I will do it for all the dependence between input and output of the graph. Okay, so I will have a lot of arrows in the graph. And then we have a trivial claim, which is that if your classical circuit has small depths and has bounded fanin, then all the output bits can depend only on a small amount of input bits. Okay, this is because the classical circuit has small depths and each gate has bounded fanny. Okay, so any output bit can depend only on a small number of input bits. Okay. So now, so based, based on this, um, claim, we can easily see that each node cannot be the end, pen, the end point of too many arrows because there is not too many dependency between uh, inputs and outputs in the circuit due to this uh, simple claim. And this also means, so we can show that easily by a combinatorial argument, that there exists a long cycle on the grid that avoids all long arrows. For example, this one. 
More precisely, the cycle is such that there is no, it does not contain both extremity of any long arrow. So there may be small arrows here between two nodes on the cycles. There may be some nodes which are the starting point of a long arrow or the ending point of a long arrow, but there is no long arrow with both extremity on the cycle. We can show that such cycle exists. And now, if you consider the string A that specifies this long cycle, okay, the string A that specifies this subgraph of the grid, the red subgraph of the grid. Then from exactly the same argument as before, it's a ring. So the same argument as in the first part of the talk, we can show that the circuit cannot work for all string B, okay? You cannot classically simulate the measurement of COM of measuring the graph state corresponding to this red cycle in all possible bases. You cannot do it because there is no long communication on the cycle, because there is no long arrow. Okay? And so that's why how we can prove the second part here. Okay, so there exists an input, there exists an A and a B, such that the specific classical circuit does not work. So this gives you worst case classic, classical hardness. And now we'll prove an average case version of that result. And to do this, I will introduce a new construction. I call the construction the extended graph. It can, it, you can define an extended graph for any graph. You start from a graph and you introduce one vertex at the middle of each edge of the graph. And this gives what I call an extended graph. So this has been studied a little bit um, in um, other papers of quantum uh, information, quantum computation, for example, this one. But the use is slightly different in our work. Okay, and we will especially consider the extended graph of the two grid. So we'll mostly work on this graph. Okay. So now, the key uh, insight is the following. So consider any cycle of the extended graph of the 2D grid. And consider it as a triangle by dividing the cycle into three parts. Okay, the top side, the right side, and the, say, the left side. And so you have three corners. You assume that each corner gets a bit as in. So now, let's consider the following uh, protocol, very similar to what we had before. The node prepares a graph state corresponding to the whole graph, everything. The whole graph has constant degree so that this can be done efficiently. Then each non-corner node measure its qubit in the X basis. And the corner nodes use the same rule as before. If the input bit is zero, you do the measurement in the X basis. Otherwise, you do the measurement in the Y basis, okay? Okay, and if N is a total number of vertices, when you do this experiment, you obtain as an input a binary string of length large N. And it's easy to analyze the uh, output distribution. This quantum protocol samples from the uniform distribution over all binary strings, satisfying, again, two conditions. This one, which is exactly the same as before, except that we are working on the green node. So MR is this, 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 the parity of these three things. ML is the parity of this, 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 this this and this, and MT stop parity of this, this and this. Okay, all are measured in the X basis. So again, the measurement operator is in the stabilizer of the graph state. So you obtain zero with probability. And you have another condition, depending again on the uh, input bits. Okay, 
very similar to before. But before you have you had M odd. Now you have M all. And M all is a parity of the outputs of all the blue nodes. All the blue nodes of the whole graph. Not only the blue node on the cycle, also the blue node outside the cycle. Okay. So it's very easy to show that this is precisely what we obtain when you measure, when you implement this quantum protocol. Okay, and very similarly to before, you can show that classically, you really need uh, communication between distant nodes in order to simulate the same, uh, to obtain the same uh, output distribution. It's the proof is essentially the same as before. Okay, so basically what we have done, we have extended the non-locality result of uh, Barrett at all. They did it for the triangle or ring. Now we do it for the extended graph of a two grid. And this is the main insight in order to get our result. Okay, so we are almost finished. So let's come back to the proof of the classical lower bound by Bravi, Gosset, and Kellick. Okay, so remember I said there exists a long cycle that avoids all longer rows, so there isn't any uh, long communications over this cycle. And then we said, let's consider, let's remove everything except the red cycle. So let's consider this. Okay, we did this because we had a result, a non-locality over a cycle. So we really needed to have a cycle on here. But now with our new argument, we have a result about non-locality over a two-degree grid, an extended two-degree grid. Okay. So we don't need at all to remove everything except the cycle. You can keep the original two-degree grid. And the new argument will work on everything here. Okay. So you don't need to do any removal. What does it mean? This means that actually you don't need in your input the first part, the part A that specifi specifies a subgraph of the two grid. Okay? You can define the problem with only one input, B. B specifies the basis on which you will, um, in which you will measure each qubit of your graph state. But you don't have the part A, only the part B. The problem is given B to measure the extended graph of the square root in the specified basis and to output the measurement outcome. Okay, and quantum analysis can be done in constant depths because the extended graph state has a constant degree. The constant, well, the extended, uh, yes, the extended graph has constant degree, so the corresponding graph state can be constructed in constant depths. And classically, is exactly as I said, the non-locality argument works from our main theorem. It works even on the extended uh, graph of the two grid. Okay, so you get exactly the same result, but with without the need to remove a big part of the graph. So without the need of a new of the, the part A of the, the input. Okay, so this means that the, the main conclusion is that we can show that any classical circuit that solves the problem on a constant fraction of the input B requires logarithmic depth. Okay. And here it's a constant fraction. And if you, uh, ampli you can easily amplify this result to show that any classical circuit that solves the problem with a non-negligible fraction on the input requires logarithmic depths using standard techniques. The idea is simply to uh, solve, to ask it to solve multiple instances of the problem in parallel. Since quantum Lee can solve one instances with probability one, this will also work if with probability one, if you ask to simulate multiple instances. And in the classical case, the uh, success probability will decrease. Okay. 
So we can show that any classical circuit that solves it with non-negligible fraction on the input requires logarithmic depth using this trick. And uh, yeah, so for technical reasons, we don't work on the extended um, to grid. We work on the graph slightly more complicated, which has this form. So it's look like a little bit more um, involved, but uh, the main idea exactly similar as uh, what I described um, for the uh, extended to grid. The second point is that I considered uh, in this talk a sampling problem, but this can be also the uh, same separation can be shown for a relation. So if you prefer working with a relation, it's very easy to convert the result I explained into a separation for a relation. Okay, so the, the, the key to do the conversion is that currently what I explain is the following problem. I use the following sampling problem, sample from a distribution corresponding to measuring in the basis specified by the string B, the extended graph state of the square grid. The relation version of that problem will be simply to output any possible outcome that appears with non zero probability when measuring in this basis, the extended graph state of the square. And of course, the quantum, the quantum protocol I mentioned, the quantum circuit I described um, a few minutes ago, will work also for this relation version. And we can show that the classical lower bound also holds for this relation version. Okay. Okay, so to summarize as a result, uh, the result, the theorem for, um, by Bravi, Gosset, and Koenig was uh, worst case, hardness. Okay, so any classical circuit that solves a problem on all inputs require log depth. Our result simply says that any classical circuit that solves a problem with high probability on a non negligible fraction of inputs require log depth. So it's a stronger separation. And we can actually rewrite a little a bit differently the result. Instead of writing this, you can simply say that when the out input is taken uniformly at random, then any classical circuit that solves a problem with non-negligible probability will require logarithmic depth. Okay, and this is the most, this kind of input taken uniformly at random is some kind of most natural input distribution. Okay. So let's uh, describe uh, quickly the relation with the uh, concurrent walks. As I mentioned, very similar results have been uh, obtained independently by other, many other, uh, three, at least uh, three other uh, teams. So I will explain the, the analogies and the differences. So first, a very similar statement was obtained uh, um, by um, Bravi, Gosset, and Koenig in the journal version of, the, of their paper. So in the appendix, they give a finer analysis of the original construction. And especially, the final analysis shows that there exists an input distribution, such that any classical circuit that solves a problem with constant probability requires log n. It's not non-negligible probability because they don't do this amplification trick with it. So here it's a little bit weaker. And another thing is that their result is not for the um, uniform distribution. It's for some input distribution, which is not very difficult to, to it's not a very difficult to distribution, but it's not uniform. So our result in that perspective can be seen as a little bit stronger because the input distribution is uniform. Another um, version, a similar version, similar result has been obtained by Kudron, Start, and Vidic. Uh, it's not for uh, the uh, uniform distribution, but they achieve a non-negligible probability here, as in our case. And the very nice thing is that they also discuss applications to randomness expansion. And the last version I would like to discuss is by uh, Bene Watts, Kotari, Schaeffer, and Tal. And they show that 
It's a much stronger result because they show that even any unbounded finding classical circuit requires log depth in order to solve this problem. All the other three versions are only for um, classical circuits with bounded finding. This classical lower bounds holds even for circuit with unbounded finding. So it's a much more strong, a much stronger result. And it's obtained by using a deep classical techniques so from classical complexity theory in order to prove the stronger lower bound. Okay, some conclusion, recent works and open problems. So essentially all the works I uh, presented in the previous uh, slide showed that there exists a computational problem that can be solved very efficiently using uh, in the quantum case with constant depth, but classically it requires log depth, even uh, on the average case, okay? A recent development has been a noisy version of this theorem. Okay, so for this theorem to hold, you really need the quantum circuit to be perfect. If there is some noise in the quantum circuit, it completely destroys the quantum correlation. Bravi, Gosset, Koenig, and Thomas Michael showed how to obtain a similar result, robust against noise, and they do it using error correction techniques. It's actually uh, fairly non-trivial because Error correcting requires logarithmic depth, and we want to do things in log depth. And the really key insight is that error correction modulo polycorrections can be done in constant depth. Okay, so it's not full error correction. It's error correction modulo polycorrection. This can be done in constant depth because uh, Clifford gates uh, commute with a uh, a poly correction, so you can put everything, all the poly correction at the end. Okay, and um, the key is the, the key um, the key point of the proof is to show that you are the error correction done modulo poly corrections is hard to simulate classically. So it's a fairly non-trivial proof, but this can be done. And the, all these results together show the superiority of classic, uh, quantum computation of a classical computation without any conjecture or assumption. So it's an inconditional result, a very strong thing. And another very uh, good thing is that all the quantum circuits are easy to implement because it's a low de low de very low depth, constant depth, typically very simple architecture, two degree or two degree. One, even one degree, it's uh, robust to noise, at least this version. So it's a very, it should be very easy to implement. Of course, the main drawback is that it separates only quantum constant depths and classical logarithmic depths, okay? And the main open problem is to show an advantage against stronger classes of classical circuits. For example, understand whether you can generalize this uh, approach to show an advantage of low depth quantum circuits over say classical circuits of depth log n or even super logarithm. Okay. But it's extremely challenging because for even for sampling problem or relation, we don't know any good classical techniques from co computational complexity to prove such strong low up. Something has been done very recently by Greer and Schaffner. It's shown that it is possible to show such kind of result for interactive problems, not for relations or, um, or sampling problems, but for interactive problems. So a new kind of uh, computational problems. Okay. Okay, so this is all what I wanted uh, to, uh, to, to talk about. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Okay, um, thanks very much for an exceptionally clear talk. Um, so uh, yeah, so if uh, people are chatting, checking the chat, then it's time for questions. Uh, so I know also if people want to raise their hand and interject, I'll be watching to let you in. Um, while we're waiting, I just have a very quick technical question. Um, could you just clarify what you meant by uh, non-negligible uh, in terms of probabilities or numbers of inputs? Yes, yeah, so, uh, 
non-negligible mean uh, very close to zero. So the one over polynomial. One over polynomial. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. That's one what I. Uh, can even be even worse. One over an exponential, small exponential is also okay. Okay. Small in terms of the base of the exponential. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, All right. But you yeah. can think about one over one over n. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Uh, I think we're still waiting on a couple of other questions. So I also wanted to ask. So um, you you indicated the obvious open problem of uh, trying to find a classical a classical sampling problem that's worse than log n. Um, are, are there any ideas at all, however half baked, about how to do that? So as I mentioned here, uh, the main issue is that uh, we don't know to prove such strong classical lower bounds. Mm -hmm. We don't have good techniques. Mm -hmm. So we cannot really hope to obtain the non-conditional separation for a standard problem like a relation or even a sampling problem. So you have to, to, to put some kind of, um, to change a little bit the, the, the way the input is given or to add some kind of uh, assumptions or things like that. And this is really what they did here. Mm -hmm. They assume that they consider interactive problems, so they assume that the input is given in two times. You are given the first part of the input, you have to output something, then you are given the second part, and you have to output something. So they are changing a little bit the, 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 the rules of the game. Right. And in such settings, you can prove much stronger lower bounds. Okay. Yeah. So the main the hope is really to, to change a little bit the rules because it's seems too ambitious to, to, to prove such strong lower bound in the regular, uh, in the regular setting. Yeah, okay. Yeah, really fascinating question. Um, okay, uh, yeah, no, so thanks again. Uh, again, exceptionally clear talk. I understood absolutely everything you said, which is a bit rare. Um, so um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think there's any questions from the audience, but that's probably a sign that the talk was very clear.